neutrality. And uh, next and last, but certainly not least in uh, this round, uh, we have P.W. Singer or Peter Singer. Um, he is a senior fellow at Brookings Institute and the director of the institution's 21st Century Defense Initiative. Um, you may have heard him because he is speaking around the country about this topic. And uh, we're really, really excited to have him here. I want to make one quick point, and that is you'll notice that the format of these slides are a little bit different. And the reason for that is because he actually got them to me so quick that it was before I, you know, I laid down the hammer as far as all the rules. So you'll see a little bit of video and some cool things in here. But uh, again, we're really excited to have P.W. Singer. explosive device, a roadside bomb. Now, the team that's hunting for this IED is called an EOD team, Explosive Ordnance Disposal. And they're the pointy end of the spear to stop these roadside bombings. And back in 2006, there were more than 2,500 of these roadside bombings every single month in Iraq. And they were leading cause of casualties among both American soldiers as well as Iraqi civilians. By the time that soldier got close enough to see the telltale wires coming out from that device, it exploded. And when the dust settled, the rest of the team advanced. They found little left. And that night, their unit commander did their sad job and wrote a condolence letter back to the U.S. And you actually saw that condolence letter there. They talked about how tough the loss had been on their unit. They talked about how that robot had saved their lives time and again. But then they talked up the silver lining that they took away from that loss. And this is what they wrote. They wrote, quote, at least when a robot dies, you don't have to write a letter to its mother. And so Wire for War is about how there's something amazing going on in war today that we don't talk enough about. That's something amazing in terms of the history of war, and I would argue the history of humanity itself. We went into Iraq with zero unmanned ground vehicles, these ground robots that you've seen there. We now have over 12,000. We went into Iraq with just a handful of drones, pilotless planes. We have more than 7,000 right now. And these are the Model T Fords, the Wright Brothers Flyers compared to what's coming. That is the technology term killer app takes on a whole new meaning when you're talking about systems that are increasingly being armed with everything from machine guns to rockets to missiles, you name it. And those numbers right now are where we're at right now. That is 12,000 on the ground, 7,000 in the air. But very soon, one Air Force three-star general that I talked with said, we'll be talking about, quote, tens of thousands of robots fighting in our conflicts. And they won't be tens of thousands of these kind of robots. They'll be tens of thousands of tomorrow's robots. That is because one of the things you have active in technology is Moore's Law, the idea that we can pack more and more computing power into our systems. They double every two years in their computing power. If Moore's Law holds true, our systems within 25 years will be a billion times more powerful than today. And I don't mean this sort of amorphous billion like Austin Powers. I mean literally, Multiply these systems times a one with nine zeros behind it. So what that means is the kind of things that we used to only talk about at science fiction conventions like Comic-Con need to be talked about by folks like us gathered here, need to be talked about in the halls of power, need to be talked about in the Pentagon. We are living through a robots revolution. Now, I need to be clear here. I don't mean the governor of California is going to show up at your door all of the Terminator in his time soon. Rather, we have new technologies that force us to ask questions about not only what is possible that wasn't possible before, but also what is proper, that is, what is the right and wrong with these systems. These technologies, the equivalent are things like the printing press, the computer, the atomic bomb. And this aspect of living through the end of humankind's 5,000 year old monopoly on the fighting wars is what fascinated me and what drove me to write Wired for War. And so think about the kind of questions that come out of this. I went around interviewing everything from the scientists who build them. How do they decide what to build, whether to arm them? The science fiction authors who inspired them. What do you think about the things from fantasy coming true? And in fact, I've discovered a lot of them consult for the Pentagon. The soldiers. What is it like 
to be a 19-year-old pilot sitting in Nevada flying a system that's over Iraq or Afghanistan? What is it like to go to war by commuting into work and then at the end of your day going home 20 minutes after killing people, sitting at the dinner table talking to your kids about their homework? What is it like for the generals and the politicians? How do our new systems affect when and where we go to war? Which we may be seeing right now in Pakistan, where I would argue we are fighting the very first robot war. We've actually carried out as many strikes in Pakistan as we did during the opening round of the Kosovo War. But we don't talk about it right now because it's just machines. It's just riskless. What about the opposite side? What do the insurgents think about our robots? What do they think about us sending robots out? How about news editors in places like Pakistan, Lebanon, India? How are they reporting on this? How does this reshape the war of ideas? And finally, what about the laws of war questions? What do people at Human Rights Watch and International Red Cross think about all of this? But there's one final question that I didn't ask those people, but I actually asked myself, and I would ask you this here. What does it say about us? That is, is it our machines that are wired for war, or is it us? Thank you.